the teachers and the student teachers are going to be listening to this podcast and might be not as familiar with the United States mm-hmm. as you are, mm-hmm. I wondered if you could start by telling us a little bit about your journey from Philadelphia to Florida and then to Minnesota. Yeah, that's exactly right, it? yeah. And whether places you've lived in have influenced mm. your writing. Oh, absolutely. So I was born in Philadelphia, and uh, when I was almost six, we moved to Central Florida, which was because of me. And I was really sickly, and I kept on getting pneumonia. At that time, uh, they still prescribed geographical cures, you know? So it's like you need to go someplace warm. So we went to Florida, and I was like Alice down the rabbit hole because the difference between Philadelphia and Florida was so profound. And it was really, for me, a very fortunate thing because the South is a storytelling culture. And I grew up on a dead-end street, and there were uh, widow ladies that lived on the other side, so uh, all the kids in the street were welcome to come into their houses, onto their porches, and they they had stories. So when I think about being a writer, I think that ending up there was very fortuitous. I mean, it's hard to, like, track all of the influences, but I definitely think that that was one. So the South shaped me in that way. And then... When I uh, was 30, I moved from Florida to uh, Minneapolis, which is, again, a big shift. But Minneapolis is wonderful because it is such um, an arts-centered community. And I have found, oddly, that, um, and the winters are very brutal, that I love winter and that I find it very conducive to writing. So this combination, and I was just, when I made this move, I was um, 30 years old and I had just started to write. So the combination of the grants, the arts grants that they would give, I got an arts grant for writing. And um, the winters and the community of writers really impacted me. And so that's where I really like knuckled down and started to do the work of writing. So I think of Minneapolis as giving me the beginning of a a writing career. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting because writers don't exist in a vacuum, do they? And I think places Mm -hmm. are important. They're not the only thing, but I think they are quite influential. Yeah, they are, and and it's also, it's all happening very much in a subconscious way. When I wrote The Magician's Elephant, you know, you're waiting for snow. And a friend said to me, finally, the weather has shown up in your books. So, you know, so for you know, because when Dixie and Tiger Rising, I was still working the South through my mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. And then I uh, went to Despero and uh, Fantasy. And then I guess Magician's Elephant would call it Fantasy Fairy Tale, too. But it's just like then I was also that bitter cold and that waiting for snow. That all came from, mm-hmm. you know, where what I'm living in without even consciously thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to use this weather, mm-hmm. you know, or consciously thinking, um, like with Gloria Dump and because of Win Dixie, that that's that's me using those ladies that lived across the street. Mm. You know, mm. that's what it was like to sit in mm. their backyard. Absolutely fascinating. Um, you've talked a little bit about having pneumonia repeated times and being beset by that as a child, which brings to mind Robert Louis Stevenson and you know, Land of Counterpain. Uh, uh, yeah. And I wondered whether that made you a reader, that kind of enforced... Of course it did, and that's what I, when I do the, when I talk to kids in schools, I, I explicitly say that, but it's so funny to me, because it, it, you think Robert Louis Stevenson, and this is the first time that somebody had pointed it out to me with, with him, the shocking number of writers who had sickly childhoods. So it's not just the reading, I think, it's learning to build interior worlds. And so that's the beginning of writing, too, because you're left to fill the void yourself. Mm, fascinating. I've heard you say that you think of yourself, and you, you've alluded to it already, uh, principally as a storyteller rather than a writer. And uh, I wonder why you prefer to use that term. You know, it's a really good question, and no one has asked me that, and you're right. I do prefer a storyteller. I I feel like, and this will sound grandiose maybe, but that I don't make up the stories. It's more like I discover the stories. And I always know the story is smarter than I am and uh, better 
than I am. So I, I feel like I'm excavating something that's very old. And so that seems like storytelling because that's we are the storytelling animal, right? Mm. That's like one of our defining as human beings. Mm. And I think it's in all of us that need for story. And I feel like like just right below the surface of everything are all those stories. And it's like that's what writing is to me is to go down and find those stories that are below the surface. Does that make mm. sense? Mm. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the stories as well that you've written. And one of the things that I personally appreciate in the writing is the warmth and the humanity that comes through. I think the adults are often very fallible, um, <laughs> but there's a lot of forgiveness in yeah. their failings. I felt that very strongly in Raimi, a nightingale with the preacher and his wife. Is that part of your personal philosophy? It, it, that goes back a little bit to the story being better than I am. And uh, when I started writing, I started off writing for adults, and I kind of backed into children's based on where I was working, which is a longer story. But what I found is I liked that thing that uh, Catherine Patterson says about how when you write for children, you're duty-bound to end with hope. You can tell the truth, but you, you, you have to end with hope. And so uh, I like that the story kind of demands that, and it makes me more aware of all the forgiveness that has been bestowed upon me by so many people, and it makes me, and the stories make me aware, aware continually of how I'm connected to so many people so that it's how I see the world but it is also how the the story helps me to see the world mm -hmm. I mean I think one of the things that I really love about it is that it doesn't tip into the saccharine just because there's that element of no because and kindness. there's um a friend of mine once referred to me as a perky curmudgeon and I think that that um part of me is in the books too mm -hmm. Like with Winn Dixie, people would always say, "Oh, it's first person. You must mm -hmm. be Opal." And I would always have to say, "No, she's a much smarter, kinder, wiser kid than I ever was." But Raimi is the kind of kid mm -hmm. that I was, and I, I just think I grew as a person. And going back and visiting that childhood self, does that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. definitely. Your stories often also feature animals whether <laughs> so, right. real or magical <laughs> right a great animal lover <laughs> yes a great animal lover and also a writer who thinks gosh I should not put an animal in this story and they keep on showing up and a kid just asked me that today at school and it's like but why and when I think back to some of the the books that I go back to Paddington all the time mm. trying to figure out how mm. Michael Bond did that. So many of the books that really moved me as a kid. Mm. Uh, Cricket in Times Square, do you know mm. that one? Yeah. And I also think as readers, we tend to let down our guard mm. more for an animal mm. character than we do for each other sometimes. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it brings out the best in the characters. Right. In your books. Yeah. So Winn-Dixie brings right. out the best in Opal, Ulysses brings out the best in flora and then in the reader as well because I mean we're all timid to offer our hearts and I think that you throw your heart over the fence more easily sometimes for uh, an animal it's safer okay so your books are very different we've got Raimi and Winn-Dixie as we said which kind of have that atmosphere and tone of being realistic uh, America to magical realism you have the contemporary and then the Baroque. Um, what do you think is the essential cake? What do I think is the defining cake? It's so funny because um, I never know what I'm doing. And so much of what I've learned about what I do, I've learned from other people pointing it out to me. Like, I remember the very first time I did a school visit and I was standing up in front of the class with the teacher, and she said to the class, okay, let's talk about the themes in this book. And I thought, oh, no. Mm. And so I'm, like, standing mm. up there smiling, going, please let some kid know what the theme is. And the kids did. You know, mm. they listed them out one by one. And those themes in Winn-Dixie 
seem to show up in everything I do. So that's mm-hmm. friendship, mm-hmm. forgiveness. And I would like to think that I'm telling the truth and making mm-hmm. the truth bearable. Mm-hmm. But let's turn to the writing process. Now, you've been heard to quote Dorothy Parker. Yep. I hate writing, but I love having written. Right. So can you tell us something about the bits that you hate and how you overcome them? I am a control freak, and I am impatient. And neither one of those things are good when you're writing or not for me because I don't map a story out in advance. So I don't know what's going to happen and I have to exist in a mess of uncertainty for a long time. And I don't know if it's going to work out or not. Um, I I don't know from one day to the next if what I'm working on is any good. And so there's a low-grade terror with it and... So that's why I do it first thing in the morning. Um, So it's before I have time to talk myself out of it. I never know if I've done it Mm -hmm. right until I get a letter from a kid. And then I think, okay, that works. But that's what, five years after I've stumbled down the stairs and Mm -hmm. and started the story. So Mm -hmm. You've also moved on to writing picture books as well. And I wondered if you were involved in the scripts for any of your films. Um, I was very involved in the script for, because of Winn-Dixie, I learned how to write a a screenplay um, and got to go to the set, and it was all fabulously interesting. And there's an American writer, Richard Rousseau, who wrote about this wonderfully and said that to work on the screenplay, it's like as a writer, you have this toolbox and it has like, you know, 40 different tools in it. And then you're down to like three when you're writing a screenplay. I was glad to get back to novel writing. Right. Yeah. And I was glad also for the chance to do it and to learn about it. And it taught me some things about story because so much has to change to make a movie work. And so I would sit with Wayne Wang, the director, and he would say, let's try this. And I would go, oh, God, we're going to, like, mess it up. You know, that's not the... But I found that the core of the story would stay there and that mm. you could play with it, and, and that was a wonderful lesson. Mm. So is Raimi in production of the film, or it's being bought as... Edward Tulane is probably going to become a movie, and I think that's the one that's in the offing right now. And right. It, it's a lovely thing when it happens... And I've learned not to think about it at all, you know. Okay. And, and and then I think also, oh, you know, it's great because it brings so many people to the book. Yeah. When that happens, it makes people aware of the book. Yeah. But you, can t- you prefer writing your Yes, novels. I do, yeah. But picture books. Yeah. Because you're launching a picture or you have launched La La La. Yeah, and it's funny to talk about that from going from screenplays because I can't draw. But a little wordless dummy with a small circle and a large luminous circle. And when I get back home, I'll do a short tour in the States for this. And um, so the promotional person called me up and said, okay, so you've got a wordless picture book and how are you going to do that? So I've made a PowerPoint about how a person who can't draw could do a concept and then it's so funny because in taking that all the way through to the end and doing that PowerPoint about it, I realized that this book is the same story that I tell in every story, which is that moment of connection between you and something larger, and it just happens again and again in my stories, and, and there it mm. is there with no words at all mm. other than law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, So in 2014-15, I think you were the ambassador, the fourth national ambassador for young people's literature, which I think is a little bit like our children's Yes, it is, yeah. And you chose the theme, I'm not surprised, having had this conversation (laughs) with you, uh, Stories Connect Us. And um, so it seems superfluous for me to ask why you chose the theme, but I'd be interested to know how you communicated that message to young readers and parents, librarians, etc. Yeah, I did it mostly by um, reminding people how powerful it is to read together, and there are a variety of ways to do that. 
reading different books in the same room has a powerful effect. You can read aloud, which is one of my favorite things to promote ever. You can have a community read. You can do like one grandfather did where he calls up his granddaughter uh, every Saturday and reads her, you know, six chapters of a book. And it goes back to us being story animals. It does something subterranean. Mm -hmm. And when you gather around a story, you connect in ways that are hard to articulate but that are really moving. And when I was doing this event with... um, Lauren last night because she's the laureate now and she asked what I did and how I did it and I said I just wanted to remind people that it's it's this is a real privilege and that's easy to lose sight of with the way that we want kids to read and we you know measure their reading level and all that but it's like the, the the important thing here is this is a privilege to get to do this and it is a joy you know to be able to go into a library and check out a book mm is a huge thing as far as the history of the world goes. Mm. Big so thing. are your books ever used for tests in the curriculum? I think and that... how would you feel about that? Are you just pleased that people are reading the book or do you feel I, you know, sad? I can only go back to myself as a kid. I'm an adult who lives to read. I was a kid who, who lived to read. So I would read a wonderful story in school and then I would turn the last page and I would think, oh God, that was so good. And then there would be, I would be faced with a list of 10 questions that I had to answer. And my heart always sank because it's not that I couldn't answer the questions. I didn't want to. Something magical had just happened and it had shifted things inside of me in ways that I probably couldn't have articulated, but I know that they were shifted. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if my stories are used that way, but I just know how I felt as a reader, as a kid. Mm -hmm. That's different than everybody reading a story together and sitting around and talking about it absolutely that's a very different thing because then you get to somebody's not asking you questions what does this mean what does this mean but rather how did you feel Mm -hmm. and and then when you're talking with other people about a story it's great because you get to articulate those things that you didn't know but questions don't do that Mm -hmm. talking with people does Mm -hmm. and something else that i you know said a lot as ambassador when you're reading with your kids at night you're not doing it for them you're doing it for both of you and parents when they do that you get to see your kid mm-hmm. in in a different way mm-hmm. as they respond to the story it's like the story is a safe place to connect mm-hmm. you know now thinking forward i hear that we're going to have Louisiana story next and never in my writing life have I done anything like that yeah and it wasn't even intentional and 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 as a matter of fact I was saying um to somebody right before I left if I had thought about it I would have never done it because it's a risky thing but I didn't have any choice she insisted all three of those girls are amazing characters. I, I love them all. And it's, you know, there are elements of Louisiana and me. And Beverly, she's the kind of kid I always wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The person who's brave enough mm-hmm. to go in and hold somebody's hand. Mm-hmm. And it's still irreverent and unafraid. And that was not me. (laughs) But I, she was very much the kind of kid that I admired. Mm. So in a sense, they're three, they represent different facets of you, even by the the wanting to be something. Yes. Oh, absolutely. That that tips my hand that Mm. that she is so admirable to me. Mm. Yeah, Mm. absolutely. And lastly, do you think we can tempt you to come over from the U.S. more frequently now? <laughs> um, I would, I, every time I come, I, I think it's wondrous. Yeah, so I think that you could. Hooray! Yeah. Yeah. 